Bang! What's popping, people? We're back again for another UFC breakdown. Seems like we've been doing these for the last 20 weeks or something. Can't remember the last time we had a break, probably about seven or eight weeks ago. It's been a long stretch, man. Every single week, I come in front of this camera and I tell you exactly who I think is going to win. I give you my picks, predictions, etc., etc. And it's a grind, man. It's a grind. Every single week, we got to grind it out. We've got to grind it out. We've got to grind it out and hope for some good results. You know, you always need a little bit of luck to go your way, a little bit of variance to go your way. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. That's the game. We crack on. Um, I'm ready for this week. I'm not deterred. You know, even though I said it's a grind week in, week out, I'm fully ready for that grind. I'm excited. You know, I haven't, it hasn't got on top of me. You know, there has been times in my career where I've been betting and it's just fucking hell, taping every week. It's just getting a bit too much, but I feel fresh. And I think because we've been smashing this year, that's probably the reason, you know. It's very easy to keep motivated and to keep fresh and to keep excited when you're winning most weeks, right? When you start losing and you go into that down streak where you lose week on week on week, that's when it can get really, really tough on the mental to keep on grinding out tape study, keep on grinding out research. And then on top of that, keep on grinding out content. So if anyone's in a little bit of a down stretch at the moment, I know a lot of people watching this video will do. We'll probably hit around five to 6,000 views on this video. So out of five or 6,000 people, there'll be a lot of people on a down streak right now. And all I have to say to you is, it's going to turn. As long as you're a plus EV better, it's going to turn. If you're a shit gambler, then unfortunately it ain't going to turn. You probably shouldn't, you shouldn't gamble or you should just tail someone who knows how to gamble, right? But if you are a plus EV gambler, then it will turn. Just keep at it. This year has been very good for me. As I said, we're up over half of a bankroll. We are well and truly into the year now. The first quarter of the year is completely done, and it's been the best start to a year I've ever had. We're coming off the worst weekend of the entire year, so that's fucking annoying. And actually, that's motivated me even more since... It's, the, it's been the worst weekend of the year. So last card it was the worst card of the year for me. I'm not going to make any excuses on the card. Obviously, the card was insanity. You know, it was the, probably the craziest card I've ever seen. Two eye poke KOs, some early stoppage. You know, I mean, I won't go into it. It was a crazy card. We won't do a recap. But um, actually, it's, it's made me motivated to come back this, this week, right? So... Although I don't give a shit about a singular week, right? Because I'm up, you know, hundreds of units over the last few years. I still care on, on, on not on a macro scale, but I still care on a week to week basis. I want to win every week. Not so much for myself, because I know it's impossible. But because I put out content for you, I don't like when people lose their money based on me. So if I give out picks and you bet on a, a pick that I give out, then you're going to lose your money. And I don't like that. That's annoying to me. Now, obviously, it's going to happen. You know, I'm never going to give out a winning pick every single week. But it still pisses me off when it happens, even though I can take it personally. If I wasn't doing any content, it wouldn't really mean anything if I lost a week. But since I'm doing content, when I lose a week, it gets me a little bit annoyed. So, you know, I want to bounce back this week. Hopefully, we can continue the great year we've been doing. And it's not even hopefully. Obviously, we're going to continue it. The system is refined. And hopefully this week's going to be a big week. You know, I don't know about this week specifically. I got a lot of bets on this card. I got a lot of underdogs, underdog shots on this card. And I'm going to speak about some of them today. We'll go, we'll go through the main card first. And then maybe we speak about the um, some of the prelim fights. If anyone wants a specific prelim fight, let me know. And, you know, maybe I'll touch on it as I have done in previous cards. Um, so, yeah, a little introduction there, boys. I'm going to go on the computer and bring up my screen for you now. Shout out to the 127 live viewers we have in the house. And you already know I'm going to address the chat very shortly. So let's bring up my screen right here. Actually, I'm going to go here. No, I'm going to go here. No, I'm not going to go there. Am I going to go there? Bro, where's that? There we go. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. I don't know why that disappeared. So yeah, shout out to everyone here. we got Gus. Let's fucking go, boys. Bang. Finally, finally made it to a live spot. What's up? I need a big weekend. Like and share, brother. Thanks for the wisdom. You're welcome, bro. Appreciate that. Daz Files, bang, bang. God down is saying, Alan Moneyline, James, we respect you, win or lose. Appreciate that, bro. When are we getting UFC 300 bets? You, they're coming, bro. They're coming. This weekend, I have PFL, 
UFC, that's enough just right there. Then we got LFA as well and fucking KSW. So I can only do so much, boys. So relax. We're going we're gonna to get the bets. Don't worry. Um, they will be coming. Why didn't you go with Manon? You did say a lot of people you respect were on Manon. So I don't go with Manon because people I respect are on Manon. And I've never based my bets on that. Now, sometimes the people I respect are going to win. That's why I respect them. But more often than not, I have found to make more money when I don't listen to people I respect and I just listen to myself. And that's just a fact. And obviously, you should always listen to your own reads if you're confident in your reads because it's just much easier for the mental. And I always say this is like, if you make a prediction and you change your prediction based on what someone else says, but then your prediction wins, that's going to eat you up mentally. It's going to be very hard for you to deal with that. Now, the opposite is not true, right? If you have a prediction and then you change your prediction based on what someone else has said, someone else says, and then they are correct, yeah, you're going to be happy you listen to them, but it isn't really, you ain't really going to even think of it. You're going to be like, oh yeah, thanks James, you changed my prediction on that one and you're going to move on. But if I change your, if I change your prediction to a losing bet, you're going to be so fuming, so angry. And so for the mental aspect of the game, you should always go on your own read if you're confident in that. Um, and like, I, like speaking about that fight specifically, I mean, Manon looked great, but I just feel like one takedown and like the entire fight completely changes. And now Aaron probably looks minus 300. That's just my view on the fight. I always had that view pre-fight and I have the same view after the fight. Um, I didn't mention it on social media after because it just looks bad. People are going to say, oh, you know, yeah, you should have bet on Manon, you were stupid. But you know, my prediction pre and post fight hasn't really changed too much on that one. Obviously, Firo looked really good. Um, anyway, boys, we'll get into the card straight away and then I will readdress the comments as always. So we'll just go for the we won't we won't go we won't start the main event. I don't know why Chris Curtis is on my screen. So we've got Brendan Allen versus Chris Curtis, and this is a rematch, as you know, a rematch. Um, I think they fought about two or three years ago now. And Chris Curtis knocked him out in the second round. So we'll speak about that fight as we get to it. But first of all, we're going to start with the first fight on the main card. This is Trevor Peak versus Charlie Campbell. Good fight, man. Really, really good fight. You know, Charlie Campbell's a good fighter. Seems to be one of these fighters with a with a decent skill set. I like his striking. It's very dynamic. You know, he has a lot of different shots in his arsenal, which I like to see. I love to see, to be honest. You know, like I do all martial arts. I train MMA very regularly. But striking has always been the first martial art that I like, right? Striking is all... I started out with boxing when I was very young because all of the UK boys, we, we do boxing. And then I moved on to Muay Thai and Thai boxing was my first um, real martial art. You know, I've had my first fights ever have been in Thai boxing. Well, legal fights, you know, not on the street. My first actual like sanctioned fights have been in Thai boxing. So anyone who's a good striker, I just I just like them a little bit more. That's why I'm such a big fan of Peyton Talbot. He's an elite striker, you know, he's fucking, he's, a, he's an animal in the striking. So I like Charlie Campbell for that reason. Anytime I see a fighter with the ability to throw multiple different strikes, like Charlie Campbell throw long uppercuts from like far out of range, but I also throw very short uppercuts close in range. I mean, just that specifically. You won't hear that many people speaking about that such a specific thing, right? But you will hear me speak about it because I love striking. So when I see a fighter do that, I'm a little bit of a fan of them, right? So I'm a fan of Charlie Campbell. You know, he's got flying knees, got some spinning shit. He's a good fighter. He's a good striker. Um, and then Trevor Peak, on the other hand, it's like he's got half of the skill set of Charlie Campbell, but probably double, double the heart uh, and the will to win. And I don't even mean heart because, like, Charlie probably has fucking a ton of heart as well. It's not really heart. It's just Trevor Peak's got that durability. Trevor Pete's got that Nate Landwehr um, dog about him where he's going to walk forward into range. Like, Charlie just ain't blessed with that chin. Charlie just ain't really blessed with that, that craziness, that, that cardio, you know? So it's not even that Charlie doesn't have the heart that Trevor Peak does. It's just that he ain't blessed with the stuff that Trevor Peak ha does, uh, is, like the, the, the durability, really, which is what turns you into a dog. The only reason you're a fucking dog it's because you've got durability. If you ain't got no durability, you can't be a dog, even if you want to be, you know? Imagine Phil Halls had the heart of Trevor Peak, But we would never know because the guy gets knocked out on any punch, right? So I think there's a big clash of styles here. Trevor Peak's going to walk forward and he's going to get teed off on badly. But I trust his ability to survive just because I've seen him take bombs before. 
Um, and I think he's going to be able to take bombs from Charlie Campbell. Look, is it impossible he gets knocked out? Of course not. I mean, this is a fist fight, and Charlie Campbell is going to tee off on Trevor Peak's head for a, for a long time. But I mean, Trevor Peak's got that solid head, that solid jaw, as you can see to the left of the screen right now, that solid jaw. And um, I do think he's going to be able to withstand some punishment in this fight. And then this fight really comes down to whether we get that momentum shift and when we get it. Because I do think we'll get some momentum shift in this fight. I think after the first seven and a half minute mark, um, and obviously Peak has, has a chance to knock him out early. You know, we've seen Charlie Campbell with his last loss, he got knocked out in the first round. But, you know, I feel like if Trevor Peak wins this fight, more often than not, it probably comes a little bit deeper into the fight. So a little bit into that second round and that third round. And it's just whether we get that momentum shift now. It's like, is Campbell going to use some takedowns and some grappling here to control Peak? I think it's very hard to control Peak. I don't think it's easy to grapple him. But I do think it will be smart to offset some of that pressure that Peak will put on um, Charlie Campbell by using some of the takedowns, which, to which I do believe he has the ability to do. Um, so I understand Charlie Campbell being a slight favorite, but I think that there's a big equalizer in not maybe not the punch power, but just the durability edge. I think Trevor Peak has a big durability edge. Um, I think he has potentially a cardio edge because, I mean, I've just seen him go absolute insanity. Um, and most of his fights don't go long. But, I mean, I've seen him go kind of crazy against Chepe Mariscal, even though the Yaya fight wasn't the crazy pace. At times, he'd done some mad shit, and he was still live easy in that third round, easy 30-27 for him. So I feel like Peak's got a bit of a cardio edge, bit of a durability edge, bit of a will-to-win edge, just all of those things that come under the dark uh, will-to-win like um, framework, all of those edges... I lean to peak having those edges. And so at the plus 180, plus 170 number, I don't mind a shot on Trevor Peak here. Now, I don't know what the line is specifically at the moment. If we just bring this up, we can have a look. Um, Trevor Peak is plus 150. Now, would I play Trevor Peak at plus 150? I mean, at this point, the line is trending towards correct. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe I'd have a little flutter on him. I'm not going to comment too much on that. I'd have to sit down and think about it. But I know Trevor Peak was plus 180 earlier in the week. And I do think that was a decent bet. I don't think the line should be that wide, just based on just based on the, um, the equalizers that Trevor Peak has in this matchup. We've got Mason Pennington saying, let's get that money. What's up, brother? MMA live mover. What's up, pimp? My guy, we're going to go live with him very shortly. Um, when I say shortly, a couple of days. Sup, boys, blunt force, repping. What's going on? If you've got some time, you think we can go over some PFL action? Kind of interested in what you're looking at. Yeah, potentially, bro. Potentially. I do have training um, in not too long, so I don't know if I'll have time. But let's see if we get past um, these fights quickly, then maybe I can touch on it. MMA Live Mover saying, I met Fernando Rodney today. Did he knock you out, bro? I'm surprised you're, um, I'm surprised you're still making comments. you got to be careful around Fernando. Personally, more excited for PFL tomorrow than UFC Saturday. We got a hipster in the chat called Gam. Yo, Fernando Rodney, a legend call out. You know that you fought him or you met him. Yeah, there you go. That's what I'm saying. One doesn't meet Fernando Rodney and not scrap, but he's still here to tell the tale. So, you know, line mover, he's the BJJ guy. He probably took him down, took his back and that. Fernando Rodney's got hands, but my boy's got the grappling in the back pocket, you know. Rodney was a beast. See, he took his first L. I already said that. What else we got going on? Apparently, Peak has been training with Chepe Marisco in Colorado. Yes. Yes, I have um, heard that, which is a great a great thing that um, he did, right? So he got beat up by Jose Marisco. And now he's going um, training with him. So that's that's solid, man. Um, bang, what, what we got going on? He'd been training with Chepe and Gaethje. I like that because he lost to Chepe. So Chepe able to reel him in and say this is what you did wrong. Yep, 100%, man. I just hope that he doesn't change his style too much. Because at the end of the day, man, I don't really think that there's that that much that he can do that is going to benefit him to change his style. So what I mean by that is sometimes you see these fighters change their style completely and technically they've got better. Technically, they're more refined, but it actually impedes on their style and who they are as a fighter. That's why I hate when you go to some of these gyms and then, you know, they'll tell you to fight a completely different way than what you're used to. But it's like, I've got my own style, you know, I've, I like the way I move, like I learned a specific way of moving. Now, obviously, there's certain ways to do things right or wrong. But like, 
you see how the way Israel Adesanya fights, yeah? That's not a great way to fight. He's got his hands down. He leans back out of range for punches. I mean, if you go to a tie boxing school or even a kickboxing school, they're going to tell you to have your hands up, to, to, to lean a little bit more forward on the front leg, whereas um, Adesanya, my guy's like leaning all the way back, like sometimes even landing punches from a lean back stance. And a lot of things he does are quote unquote wrong, technically, right? But it works for him. Michael Venom Page. I know he comes from this uh, karate style, but like in MMA, 99% of people, if Michael Page w walked into their gym, they'd be like, don't do that. Stop doing that. You're going to get taken down. Or you're going to get your leg kicked out. But I mean, he's one of the best fighters in the world weight division. So I mean, it's just like, I don't. I hope they don't change Pete too much. And I don't think they will. You know, I don't think they will. I mean, Gage is a madman there. Mariscal's a madman anyway. It's not like he's going to some... It's not like he's going to uh, City Kickboxing, where City Kickboxing, you know, they have a very specific style. All of the fighters fight like that for the most part. He's going to a, a, a camp where those fighters, they're kind of wild anyway. So, you know, I, I'm not expecting him to come out and change his style so much that it actually hurts him. PKO round two and round three, is that, 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 those are huge prices, brother. Um, and I didn't actually know that. So thanks for letting me know that. You know the props are fully released market-wide from today. So that means that I'm allowed to um, send them out to my guys now because obviously I'm not a fraud capper like 99% of the cappers. So I don't actually send out props um, before they're widely available. But now they are widely available. I bet with a goat saying, my man spitting game, UFC knowledge. Appreciate that, brother. Get back week loading. You already know. All right, man. Let's get back this week. Bang, bang. Yeah, let's get back on the track, man. Let's get back on track. So what we got going on? Lucas Bresky versus Volta Walker. This is funny, right? Because Volta Walker is the brother of Johnny Walker. But I mean, take a look at that guy's face. Does he look like he's the brother of Johnny Walker? Guy looks like he's the brother of fucking Marcin Tybora or something. You know what I mean? He definitely doesn't look like he's the brother of Volta Walker. My guy looks like some Russian motherfucker. And guess what? He trains in Russia. If you scroll down here, you can see he's fighting out of Moscow, Russia. He trains in Russia. He looks Russian, but apparently he's Brazilian and Johnny Walker's brother. So I don't know, man. T take, take what you want from that, but he is a good fighter. I, I, oh, all right, all right, all right. He's not a great fighter, but I think for the heavyweight division, he has a decent game. And what I mean by that is that like, he's going to go out and take you down, man. He's going to grind you out. A lot of people will be looking at this guy, realizing he's Johnny Walker's brother and thinking, oh, yeah, he's just going to fly and knee you. He ain't a meme. He ain't a meme like his brother. He ain't going to be getting flying knee KOs, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, he's six foot six. He could definitely land it if he throws it. But from what I've seen of him, he ain't Johnny Walker, right? This guy has a game plan. He goes out, he takes you down, he grinds on you. And he's very, very strong, man. He's six foot six, 81 inch reach. And if they have they got his, let's have a look at his last weigh in, because this guy is a fucking monster. His nickname is the Clean Monster. So, I mean, if you look at his fights, you probably won't be calling him the clean monster. You might be calling him a monster. I'd like to know what you think about that nickname because it's a very interesting one. So his last weigh-in, so there's actually no um, record of his last weigh-in. I'd probably have to go back, watch the fight and find out what he weighs in. But I, he's, he's definitely close to the limit anyway. Maybe he's 250 or something, but the guy's a fucking huge guy. He's going to have reach on Bretsky. He's going to have height on Bretsky. And he's going to have weight on Bretsky. And he's just going to have an athleticism advantage on Bretsky as well, even though he's the bigger man, in my opinion. Um, Bretsky, I don't like this guy. I don't think he's a good fighter. I, I always thought it was a bad fight. I actually bet Dylan Potter are like plus 300 against him. And like going back and watching that fight, um, I guess Bretsky like looked decent in that fight. You know, it was a, it was a very weird stoppage. But I mean, I know why I bet Dylan Potter. You know what I mean? Like, I know why I laid Dylan Potter plus 300 or plus 250 or whatever it was. Bretsky, he's got issues with takedown defense. On the feet, he's very basic. Um, it's not impossible for him to win this fight, but I think Volta Walker would have to have a very bad performance. And I think he would have to be suffering from um, UFC debut jitters for him to lose this fight. I just think that the takedowns are going to be there. You know, we've seen before Bretsky get taken down. Um, and, you know, Carl Williams couldn't really hold him down. But who does Carl Williams hold down? He didn't really hold down Justin Tuffle that well. Um, you know, Carl Williams is always a guy who's going to get multiple takedowns in his fights. He's not going to get one takedown and, and finish you. And he's a negative finisher. 
Carl Williams can't finish anyone. So I, I, I do think that Vault Walker actually has a more finishing upside on the ground. And the thing is, is he's, he's not an old heavyweight. He's 26 years old. He's improving. I just feel like the ceilings for these guys are so different. Like if Bresky wins this fight, it's probably he's probably going to look like minus 110. He's going to get taken down and win split decision on damage or something. Um, whereas Vault Walker can literally look minus 1,000. He can take him down and just ground and pound him. Or he can take him down for three rounds. I truly believe that. So, yeah, I'm picking Vault Walker in this matchup. I don't... I don't think it should be that hard for him. I will say, though, that Walk, Walker's going to get found out at some point. You know, he, he's got a decent ceiling just because he's a heavyweight grappler, you know, and there's not many of them. And, you know, he, he is a little bit functional in that regard. But I do think at some point he's going to get, you know, found out quite quite easily. You know, he's definitely not a great fighter. Um, I'd say that he's, his ceiling is probably similar to Johnny Walker's to his brothers in terms of he ain't ever the top 10 five guy but maybe hits the top 15 just because the division's quite shallow so i could see him hit the top 15 here i mean it's not hard to get top 15 in the heavyweight division but it'd probably be about 15th and then get knocked out so something like that i would say but mate he's 26 at the end of the day i expect him to be improving every fight and you know his game lends itself to heavy improvements because he's he's the grappler so we could just see him get better better um, get better and better from fight to fight. We really could. And it, if, if he sorts out his top control and ground and pound, he's going to be a bit of a problem because I think he can always get guys down. You know, I think that he's going to be able to land takedowns on most fighters in the heavyweight division. So if he gets really good ground and pound of control, I think he's going to be able to fuck a few people up, man. I definitely I definitely would say that. Um, next fight, we've got Ignacio Bahamondes versus Christos Gargos. And man, I don't really have too much of a... Um, opinion on this fight like i i want to tape it a little bit more for, for my money and this might be a bit of a lazy take but i don't see too much difference from the gargos and zelhuber fight i mean ignacio bahamondes is a similar guy to zelhuber they're both mainly strikers with some nice front chokes they're both got a lot of volume they both got very good cardio for their weight for their size for their height they're both very tall very long um, you always wonder how they both make lightweight. They're both from South America and they both fight similarly. I think Zohub is a better fighter, but I don't think the fight is going to be much different from that fight in that Gargos will have a good first round and fall off a cliff in round two and round three. And he's done it time and time again throughout his career. And I see it happening again. I think that the line is wide here. I don't think that Bahamonde should be a minus 350, um, but I don't have the balls to play Christios Gargos here because. I just, I just don't have a confident read on if there's value on that or not. You know, I, I, I tend to think that the line's a little bit wide, but Bahamanda is probably going to get to him in round two or round three, whether it's via KO or via submission. So, you know, not a, not, not a strong stylistic technical breakdown that I can give you on this fight. You know, like I, I could give you on some other fights, but I do think that Bahamanda, you know, gets a second or third round finish. See, some fights, boys, we speak about fast, and some fights take a long time to speak about. So that's just the way the cookie crumbles. We've got Mr. Barron saying, bang, this is an OnlyFans fade. Where's Dixon? Damn, man, where's my man Dixon, bro? You meant to be here. Johnny Walker's dad went for a holiday in Russia. Yeah, you know that. Or, or, or the mum likes the Brazilians. Who knows? Um, MMA line movers saying, Sergey Spivak cousin. Yeah, exactly. Brazilian birth certificates. Clean mustard going to piss hot. Leon saying, yo, what's up? Regardless of your picks in their fights, do you think the prospects Volta and Gene are legit? So I've spoke about Volta. Um, I think Gene's a good fighter. Um, but, you know, I don't... I mean, legit, you know, legit is subjective, isn't it? Um, I, I, I think, yeah, I think I think Gene's good. I think Gene's good. I think Gene's got a good ceiling. And um, I, I feel the same about Volta, like I said, to be honest. Brzezewski all here all day here at um dog money looks like spivak yeah man walker has no volume striking though i think Volta sucks he took four rounds to finish a guy chase sherman finishing yeah that was a weird fight uh, and to be honest bro if you actually go back and watch that fight he didn't actually finish him like nicholson just retired in that fight he got taken down in the fourth round because he was getting taken down all fight and something weird happened like the ref stopped it for some reason maybe it was a verbal um 
maybe someone said something verbally and the ref stopped it. And then after the ref stopped it, it seemed like Nicholson just didn't get back up to his feet. He just kind of quit because he was very tired in that fight. But Volta was also very tired, but I guess just less tired than Nicholson. And he was getting taken down over and over. And he kind of just um, he kind of just gassed out there. Walker going to get smashed 2 free. Fair enough. i probably line Bresky as a favorite over Sherman. Fair enough, bro. I bet Potter 2 was a waste of dollars. So yeah, of course it was a waste of money because it lost. But I'm happy to fade Bresky at plus 250. I'd do that all day, bro. Don't mind the overs on this one. Two low-level heavyweights. Yeah, I can see it. But I can also see Volta finish him in round one. Um, this card is such shit compared to the 300. Yep, definitely. Bang, bang, let's get this money. Ignacio by sub 2-3. Seems that way, doesn't it? I don't think the odds will be that good, but you know. Um, Jermaine, Durandamy, dog barking. Under 1.45 value. Um, nah, because Bahamondes might get to him in two or three, to be honest. I was super surprised that Chepe wasn't a favorite in this fight, but I see the line has moved. Yeah, so it's a very, very close line now. It's about a pick him. You know, you'd see Tapology is a little bit older. Um, but it's fight to pick him, and it's a good fight, man. Morgan Sharia versus Chepe Mariscal. I believe it's extremely hard to have a strong take on this fight. Um, I don't really see how you can have a strong take on this fight. I guess at plus money, Mariscal, you, you can, you know, be a little bit passionate about it. You know, plus 120s, plus 130s was out there. At this point, minus 110, I just think it's going to be a close fight, to be honest, boys. I don't really see an upside for either fighter. Obviously, anything can happen. You know, it's a fight. But, I mean, my read is just not that strong in terms of either fighter pulling away with it. I could definitely see it being 1-1 going into the third round. And you're not really going to want to have your money on it. Um, Mariscal, you know, he's a good fighter. Like, he's a solid fighter. Mariscal's level of competition is a lot higher than Morgan Charrier's level of competition. Even though Morgan Charrier has been fighting some good fighters in the Cage Warriors scene, it's only good fighters in the Cage Warriors scene, whereas Mariscal has been around the American scene fighting really, really good fighters. You know, Gregor Gillespie back in the day, um, Yusuf Salau, some good fighters, right? I think that both fighters are very tough. You know, so a lot of people saying, um, or some people saying Mariscal is going to fraud check the Frenchie. Chepe going to do what Nate did last week. I don't see him doing what Nate did, to be honest, just because I think Morgan's tough, man. Um, I guess you could say Jamal Emmers was tough as well, but I don't think Mariscal's nowhere near the the type of guy who Nate Landwehr is, like in terms of the pace and the pressure and the power and just, just, the, just the finishing ability. And then I actually think Morgan's extremely tough, man. I've seen Morgan go through some solid punishment. I've seen him... Be, if uh, lose in grueling fights and not quit on himself. So, you know, I think he's a tough guy here. I just think it's going to be a close fight, boys. I ain't going to keep repeating myself. Um, I'll pick Morgan Charrier for the decision win. But, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if Chepe, you know, wins via decision here. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to say Morgan Charrier wins via decision. I guess going against the grain, you know, the entire market is on Chepe Mariscal. Everyone's betting Chepe. I'm just going to say it's a close fight and, you know, I'll, I'll lean with Morgan Sherrier a little bit there, but wouldn't want any of my money on this fight, to be honest. And if I was going to play anything at any point in time, it would have been Mariscal plus 130 odds because, like I said, Pickham is about right. Um no way Morgan is much of a flip-flop as Emmers. Yeah, he's not. Emmers is a bit of a nutter. Tanner saying, talk about wet, wet, bruv. Emmers is that to a T, absolute melt. Yeah. <laughs> Facts. All right, what else we got going on? Alexander Hernandez versus Damon Jackson. I think this is Alex's fight to lose. Like I think a lot of his fights are, but he often loses a lot of fights. But Alex is a good fighter. The athleticism difference here is massive. And what we see time and time again is when athletes Alex has a massive athleticism advantage. He usually wins the fight. You know, we've seen it recently against Jim Miller. He's a lot more athletic than Jim Miller. Um, you know, who else? We've seen it against Mike Breeden, you know, big athleticism. Chris Grootsmacher, athleticism. Trinaldo. Trinaldo's a good athlete there, but that was a very close fight. Could have went either way. Drew Dober's a good athlete. Beat him. Tiago Moises probably has an athleticism advantage over Moises, but... Moises is no slouch. Very, very high-level fighter as well. I mean, Moises beat, has beat a lot of guys at this point. Moicano, you know, the athleticism is, is the similar there. Billy Quarantillo, 
that's a very specific matchup there. Billy's an absolute animal. Um, and Bill Algio, you know, he's fairly athletic as well. He's a bit of a bit of a skinny, tall, skinny guy, but he's still, you know, he's not unathletic, I would say. So I, I think Damon Jackson's a little bit old, a little bit unathletic. I think that Alexander Hernandez is going to put some beating on him early, may get the knockout. If he doesn't get the knockout, I could also actually see him just winning the decision because the thing about Alexander Hernandez, a lot of people think that he fades in fights, but I don't think his gas tank is that bad, to be honest. And also, I don't think Damon Jackson has a great gas tank either. I've seen Damon Jackson fade in the third round more than one occasion. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, it, it gets to the third round and Alex actually has the better gas. So, you know, I think that may be a hot take because from what I've heard people say, from what people have messaged me personally, people seem to think Damon Jackson's going to like outpace him. I just completely disagree, to be honest. I do not think at all that that's going to happen. Um, Obviously, he can get the back in round three and he can win round three. I'm not saying it's impossible for him to win round three. I'm just saying that um, I don't think that Damon Jackson has such a better gas tank than Alexander Hernandez. To be honest, I think Alex might even have a better gas tank than Damon Jackson. Uh, at least in the dynamic of their fight, I think Alex is probably going to be the one fresher going late. But uh, we'll see if I'm right about that one. I, I, I think it's going to be close, but I'll give a little lean to Alexander Hernandez. So overall, I'm picking Alexander Hernandez to win the fight. I think that he probably gets a knockout based on athleticism. But if not, I think he can also, also get a decision win here. Um, Brendan Allen versus Chris Curtis, two. Yeah, I'm torn on this fight. I'm, I'm kind of leaning to bet Chris Curtis, but I don't think I'm going to pull the trigger. Brendan Allen has made some improvements since their last fight, in my opinion. It was a long time ago now. And although Brendan Allen maybe hasn't fought the highest level of competition since their fight. I have seen him, you know, I, I think his striking's improved a little bit. I think he's a little bit sharper. And he was always a decent sharpshooter. But I think he's shored things up a little bit more technical at this point. A little bit sharper. Very slightly. Ever so slightly. Um, still obviously can get knocked out. I'm literally speaking about maybe betting Chris Curtis. But I do think he's improved a little bit. Um you know, maybe his IQ has improved a little bit. I don't really know about that. But his IQ has never been a great asset of his. You know, in the fight against Chris Curtis, which this is obviously a rematch, so we should probably speak about the first fight. So Chris Curtis got a knockout in the second round against Brendan Allen in their first fight. And if you go back and watch that first fight, it was a very, very close fight. You know, it was basically 50-50 fight. You know, Brendan Allen was landing some good body kicks, a couple of leg kicks. And some decent one-twos down the middle. But Chris Curtis was landing with more power. You know, Chris Curtis has got good boxing. He was definitely rocking the head back of Allen a lot more than Allen was rocking Chris Curtis. Although Chris Curtis's face was quite bust up in that fight. You know, he had a swollen eye. And I tend to think that if that fight goes a little bit later, Chris's face is going to start swelling up. And maybe the fight is completely different to how it actually ended. But it didn't. It got into the second round. And... Um, yeah, Chris just landed a nice shot. You know, it was actually a beautiful, beautiful knockout. Chris landed a nice left hand to the body, quite like a long uppercut left hand. It was a very strange shot. It was like a little uppercut left hand to the body. And then he stepped back and on the step back, he just landed a very short hook, very short hook, right hook to the face. And Alan wobbled off that short hook. It's funny because it seemed like Curtis landed with no power, you know, but as we've seen time and time again, it's not really about power. It's just about timing and placement. And Chris Curtis timed the great shot with the short right hook and it just wobbled Allen. And from there, the knockout just came, you know, obviously Allen stayed on his feet, but it was very wobbled and he never recovered from that short right hook. And Chris Curtis pressed him up against the cage, landed him some shots and then ended up finishing him there. You know, it seemed like, I'm not going to say Allen quit, but Allen was just so badly rocked. He just, I don't think he wanted to be on the feet. He went to the, it looked like he flopped to his back from a little knee or something. And, you know, once that happened, um, you know, the, the ref finished the fight, which is which, which makes sense. The ref stopped the fight. Chris Curtis also won the first round. You know, it's probably worth mentioning who won the first round before the knockout. But he won it off a stupid leg lock. Allen dropped down for a leg lock. If he didn't do that, it would have been 50-50. Whoever won the last 45 seconds of the round would have won the fight. Um, but Brendan Allen jumped down for a leg lock. And at one point, I thought he, you know, he might have the leg lock. Obviously, I knew he didn't because I watched it before and i knew that he got knocked out but i'm pretty sure if, if i remember correctly i've taped this fight a while back but if i remember correctly the leg lock was kind of close um 
And when I say close, like Curtis was never close to tapping, but the position I saw it in, it looked like he actually got him in a good position for a leg lock. I think it was just a straight ankle lock. And um, obviously, Chris, you know, just toughed it out a little bit and then ended up reversing position. And then he, he ended the last 30 seconds of round one on top. And then he basically got the decision based on that, you know, because it was 50-50 on the feet before. So, you know, I tend to think that these guys are going to go 50-50 on the feet for the most part. Um, but obviously, Chris Curtis probably has a durability edge, has a bit of a power edge. So I, on the feet, I, I, can't, I just feel like it's 50-50. I give Brendan Allen, you know, the volume edge, the optics edge based on him being a longer, larger man. So he probably can hit him from a range where Chris Curtis can't hit him. So on the feet, I'm calling it about a 50-50. Um, I could be convinced 55-45 either way. And then on the ground, I mean, the ground is all Brendan Allen's, you know. Brendan Allen has a big, big uh, ground advantage here. He actually jumped on the back of Chris Curtis in the first fight. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he jumped on the back of Chris Curtis and choked him out in this fight. I know Chris Curtis is a very, very good fight. I don't I don't know if he's ever been submitted. I, I don't think Karamov submitted him. He just won via decision, didn't he? Let's have a look if he's ever been submitted. Um, yeah, so Karamov won twice via decision. Um, yeah, so he's never been submitted. It's, unless he got submitted by Tom Galicio. I don't know about these losses on the regional scene. Guy's been fighting since forever, man. 2003 was his first fight. So this is this is his 21st year of professional mixed martial arts, which is fucking insane. 21. How old is he? 36. That's insane. So he started fighting at 15. Basically, he took his first amateur fight at 15. Boys, what's going on with that? Is that correct? 21 years minus 36 is 15, bro. So they're saying that his first ever fight, he was 15 years old. He took an amateur fight at 15, yeah? Fair enough. And then rematched that same guy when he was 17. Fair enough. We'll never know. I, I guess it's true. Um, Wild Wild West 2003. But, yeah, I, I, I do want to... Because um, I've listened to two podcasts this week. I listened to my guys over in the club and sub. And I also listened to um, Cody Saftich with uh, Die Hard MMA, Clint. Shout out to all of those. And, you know, I didn't hear anyone mention Alan's grappling upside. You know, I, 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 and forgive me if I'm wrong, you know, I listened to the whole podcast, so they may have mentioned it. But I don't think anyone mentioned a, um, I don't think anyone mentioned Alan's potential to submit Chris Curtis here, which I do think is very live. I mean, Alan's very, very good from top position. I think he definitely has a chance to win, you know, if he gets Chris Curtis's back. I mean, a submission is a submission at the end of the day. Yeah, Chris Curtis has good sub defense, but the guy gives his back up on takedowns all the time. He gave his back up to Brendan Allen on a takedown. Why can't he give his back up again? He gave his back up to Nasadin Imarvov on a takedown. Like, I think he's probably going to give his back up if Brendan Allen takes down, um, takes him down. And then Brendan Allen, if if he gets your back, man, it could be a submission. So. I don't know the odds for it. I don't think it's going to be good because Brendan al always gets a sub uh, submission. So it's probably not going to be great. And I'm not even predicting submission. I think, you know, if you put a gun to my head, I'm going to say, all right, Brendan Allen probably doesn't submit him. I mean, it's a very specific outcome. Brendan Allen via decision is 400 via submission. Oh, my God, that's disgusting. How can you make Brendan Allen submission plus 105 if the guy's never been submitted? That's insane, to be honest. Um, that's really strange. Um, it was plus 175. It got hit massively. So I understand that. But Jesus, I'm very surprised to see that. At that point, I just like to go Allen decision. If you're gonna if you're gonna play any Allen prop, I just go Allen decision. I wouldn't be playing plus 105 on a submission. That's disgusting. I'm very upset that they was gonna give us that. I thought I'd give you a little hot take there. And I do think it is a hot take in some regards, because I don't think many people are gonna be mentioning it, but fucking hell, boys. Plus 105 is horrible. Um, but yeah, I do think there's a, you know, I do think there's a possibility to, if he doesn't submit him, at least take his back and win a round via taking his back. Um, so that's in play there. So I give Alan, I give Alan the favorite upside in this fight. And the reason is because I think the striking is very close. And I do think that Chris Curtis's face is going to be bust up. You know, I've seen it before. We've seen it when he got headbutted against Kelvin Gastelum, his face bust up badly. 
Um, Chris Curtis doesn't take damage great in terms of his eyes swell up and stuff. And in a five round fight, that can affect you a lot. And also with the judges, that can affect you a lot, you know. So I do think that that is worth mentioning. Another thing that I don't think you'll hear mentioned this week at all, but it's something that I've noticed in some of their fights, um, or in Chris Curtis's fights at least. And so I think the the striking's about 50-50 overall when you when you cap everything into it. Like I said, I can be convinced 55-45 on either side. Allen has the the length, the range, the volume, uh, the optic advantage, but Chris Curtis has the power, the damage, the durability advantage. The durability edge is, 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 is in a massive favor of Chris Curtis here, which could favor him. But then with the grappling, it's basically 100% to zero for Brendan Allen, right? Unless Chris Curtis reverses a position like he did in the first fight in the first round. But we got about a 50-50 on the feet, you know, fairly close. And then we've got a 100-0 in the grappling department. So I do think that Brendan Allen should be a favorite. But I do think there's some value on Chris Curtis. I'd personally make Brendan Allen minus 150 because although he has a hundred or uh, although he has a 90 to 10 advantage in the grappling, Chris Curtis is very, very hard to grapple. And when Brendan Allen tried to grapple Chris Curtis, he actually got reversed, you know. So although it's 90 to 10 in terms of who's going to prosper from it, I also think that, that it's still unlikely, right? It's 90 to 10 based on them, their stylistics, but I don't think it's likely. So I think for the most part, the 50-50 on the striking, on the feet is what we focus on. And so then a plus 180 in that regard, you know, is probably worth a shot. So Chris Curtis is probably worth a shot here, boys, but I don't know if I'll get to it. Um, so yeah, I'll pick Brendan Allen just because I'm saying Brendan Allen deserves to be the favorite. I'm, I'm saying he wins more often than not. But that's it, man. Dean C, is, Dean C is saying, hard to get behind Allen, even though he's looked better in previous fights. But Allen hasn't made me a believer to think he's put it all together. I mean, at the end of the day, man, <coughs> he's still going to have a bit of a dodgy chin. And he's still going to have some of the fight IQ questions. I don't think they're ever going to go, you know. Shout out to Phil Parker, losing to the 15-year-old action boy twice. Yeah, well, action boy... 15, but then 17. So I'll give him a pass for the second one. He's becoming a man. Tom Galicio runs a gym near me. Dude's kind of loopy. Yelled at. What do you mean yelled at? Did you mean yelled at me or what? Dude's kind of loopy. Yelled at. Did he yell at you? He yelled at you? But that's quite funny. A little crazy tidbit there. Chris, for anyone who doesn't know who that is, Chris Curtis's opponent when he was 16. Wait, no. Chris Curtis's opponent. Wait, where the fuck is this? Oh, yeah. Chris Curtis's opponent, who he lost to, apparently uh, lives ne near the X, X Factor. The It Factor. Curtis also has Eric Nixick in his corner in the Apex. Best coach out there, in my opinion. He will be able to hear him very clearly in the Apex. Alan struggles with strikers. Curtis is to get down. Tough to get down. I don't know. Sub is possible. But these cards have been wacky the last few weeks. 100%. Allen decision coming 48 47. Yeah, I can definitely um, see that. I bet with the goat saying, two dog, you the bomb. Let's make that Ferrari money. You already know, man. You already know we need to be making that Ferrari money. So, yeah, man. Hopefully, we're going to do it this week. Um, and that's it, boys. That's the entire main card broken down. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back with Parlay Madness with my guy, Jewish Better, in a couple of days. And yeah, man, trying to get back on the horse. As I said, um, as I said, we're coming off the worst week of the year. Last week was my worst week of the year. If you didn't know, I lost 18 units. Very annoying. It took me from 72 units of profit to 51 units, something like that. Um, so we're still up over half of a bankroll. It's still been my best year ever. Unfortunately, last week was my shittest week this year. But it is what it is. Um, you know, we're going to have lots of lots of losing events in the future. I'm sure an event later this year, I'm going to lose more than 18 units. Probably going to happen. The good part is I'm just going to win most of the weeks. And hopefully we can come back with a win here. I'm more motivated than ever because we're coming off an L. So, yeah, man, let's get back to those winning ways that we are used to. Dean C is saying, hey, James, I appreciate your time and hard work with the breakdowns on fights. Much respect and thank you. And I appreciate you. Appreciating me, brother. It's, it's all love in this chat. 
Call of Duty vlogs, Volg saying only thoughts on the PFL card. All right, we'll touch on the PFL card a little bit. Um, nothing like James and the Jew. That's as much time as this card's worth, honestly. My man. Thanks, James. You're a beast. I hope one day to be half the gambler you are. I appreciate you, man. I'm, I'm trying to give out as much information as possible on these streams. You know, a lot of people don't sign up to my stuff. Most people don't sign up to my stuff. They just get my free stuff, you know, which I don't recommend because obviously the paid stuff is where the real money comes from. But I'm still giving you out tons of free stuff all the time to hopefully make you become a better gambler. You know, my entire ethos is not, I'm going to tell you who wins between Brendan Allen and Chris Curtis. It's boring to me. I do it because people want to see it and I do love the fights. But the, the thing I actually love more by far is teaching how to be a good gambler. And one of the most important things that you can have in gambling is a non-emotional mindset. And that's the reason I hammer the point home so much is because it's literally the most important thing in the game. And it's something that people just basically never, ever fix. And they just go on their entire life losing from gambling. It's actually quite sad, but it is what it is. Odin saying, do I keep a stagnant unit size or increase the size when you make more? Yeah, I increase my unit sizes. The issue is that the amount of money I have my unit sizes are too big to get down, you know, on every single bet I play. So if I wanted to, I could have a 7K unit size. I have enough money to have that. I could do that if I wanted to. But I can't get 7K down if I had multiple unit bets. I can't get 7K down on certain bets, right? So it's like I have to cap my unit size because I just can't get the money down otherwise. So... It is what it is. It's unfortunate, but that's just part of the game. Once you once you can afford one unit being $7,000, which I'm blessed to be able to afford, I put a lot of work in to make it here, then you start having to you know, refine your process a little bit. And that's why I love my big bets and my max bets, because I'm able to place $100,000 on one fighter, like I placed $50,000 on Peyton Talbot um, not too long ago. And that was because he was fighting on a main card. I bet him all the way from 110 to 140 on multiple different books. And I was able to get that money down. But let's say I had a 7K unit size. For me to get a free unit bet down, which would be a 21K bet on an under of a UFC prelim show, I can't get that down at that number. I'd probably be able to get 21K down overall, but it'd be at worse and worse numbers. And maybe the value goes by that time. So, yeah. Um, Kobe saying, Colby is saying, appreciate you. Appreciate you too, brother. PFL Carmouj versus Velasquez. Yeah, very, I mean, I say very, a weird fight. I don't know why the fuck the PFL are booking this fight again. We've seen it twice already. Carmouj has beat her twice already. But honestly, this is a free round fight. And it's not like Velasquez was completely destroyed in both of their fights. You know, the first fight was, was a, it was it was weird the way it ended and i mean i just feel like i feel like there, there's been some line movement recently on juliana velasquez at plus 200 and i can see why you know i can see why that there was some movement on her because mma's a weird game man mma's a weird game i don't think velasquez just looked completely dominated it, 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 in certain rounds and certain moments velasquez was winning you know Velasquez is the better striker still in my opinion and I think she can have moments in that fight so for her to be plus 200 I think it's just based on her losing twice which I do think she should be an underdog but plus 200 was a bit wide so I do think the lines move based on that Carmu sub plus 500 is kind of crazy I didn't know that Carmu sub was plus 500 are you sure it's plus 500 that's kind of mad because obviously she's done it well she's grappled fucked her before so I could definitely see her doing it again Let's go over to the PFL. Let's see if we can get the PFL up. Bomb, bomb. Gorilla. Fighting her again. It must be annoying. It's also annoying for the fighter to fight the same fighter again and again and again and again. I'm telling you that now. Um... Anti Delisia. About to cook a salad. Celebratory steak. Um, Anti Delija versus Valentin Moldovsky. No, I think Valentin Moldovsky is going to win that fight. I actually think Moldovsky is quite solid, you know. 
I think Moldovsky's solid. I mean, you're saying Moldovsky lost to Baylor and they beat. Re I mean, come on, bro. Like, I, I, I'm not gonna try to. I'm not trying to call you out here, but this is like such lazy capping. I mean, honestly, the whole mindset of you typing that comment, you should just completely remove it right now. Like, literally, whatever made you think of those thoughts to type that comment, completely remove those thoughts because I'm gonna explain to you why now. Because, and look, my man's saying, just ask him. You, no, you're not just asking. This comment, you're asking based on this, right? You're saying, should we bet anti because Moldovsky lost to Beta and anti beat Renan? I'm going to tell you that whole thought process needs to be completely wiped from your mind. And I'm going to explain why. Don't take this to heart. I'm trying to help you and anyone else listening. MMA math doesn't work, right? Like my man Call of Duty says, COD. And it's true. Anti Deligia beat Renan Ferreira because Renan Ferreira is an out and out striker, right? Out and out striker. He has no grappling. And he's been beat that way before, and he'll be beat that way again. And so it was very easy to see why Anti beat Renan, right? Now, Modovsky lost to Beda in a razor close fight, a 50 50 fight. But that was a wrestler versus a wrestler. So. He, so Bader was able to negate, negate some of Moldovsky's best attributes, which is wrestling. And Bader also cracked him early, which changed the dynamic of the fight and allowed him to win a couple of early rounds there. So basically, the reason this happened on the screen, what, what, what you're writing right now, the reason this happened on the screen is because of styles, right? Styles. So Anti ain't going to take down um, Moldovsky and fuck him up on the ground and finish him in round one like he did to Renan Ferreira. So those fights almost, those fights literally almost mean nothing. Now, the Moldovsky versus Bader fight, that's a decent fight to look at for this fight. And I take it for this fight. And the reason is because Moldovsky and Bader, you know, Bader and Anti Deligia are similar in styles. You know, I'm, obviously they're not exactly the same, but, you know, they're fairly similar. But Renan is nothing like Moldovsky, right? So we ignore that one. But Moldovsky, Bader, that's a decent fight to speak about. But then that fight was razor close, though. It could have went either way, right? And Ryan Bader has proven he's ex-Bellator double champion at the end of the day. Whereas Anti Deligia, what has he really done? I mean, who's his best win? Probably Renan Ferreira. But, you know, it's a great stylistic matchup for him. So it's... I, the, a better way of looking at fights is not based on who beat who. Obviously, that's at time and place. But that's like secondary or third or fourth or fifth um a better way of looking at the fight is like the stylistics of the fight so if they beat a fighter what style was that fighter and then what style are they facing this weekend so modovsky he's a wrestler for the most part right he will grind you up against the cage he's more of an mma guy he ain't shooting double legs all the time but like he's a grinding type of guy so has the leader fought any of those type of fighters and if and if he has then how has that fight gone and we should look at that more than his fight against Renan. So, like I said, boys, I like to educate a little bit more than just say who's going to win. So, yeah, ho hopefully you understood what I'm saying. Hopefully I explained it well, um, Bulo. And they're going to feed the fam. Moldovsky is solid. I agree. We're getting a discount because he got KO by Vassell. Yeah, speaking about Vassell, man, he's got a great matchup against Vol uh, Goldsov, man. Vass Vassell's a... I love Vassell. He's like the English Jolton Almeida. I really think he is. Um yeah, I think that he's the English Jolton Almeida. Man, if he could beat Goldsov, I'd be so happy. It's not impossible, bro. If he gets on top of all, got what price they giving me for Linton the Swarm Vassell, bruv? Some random Englishman who's fucking up every motherfucker in the wrestling, fucking up the American wrestlers, fucking up the um, the Russian wrestlers in wrestling. Who's telling me English wrestling ain't good? The Swarm Vassell, bro, is a spanking every motherfucker. You know English, man. We roll hard, bro. We've only got like 60 million people. America got like, America got like 400 million and that, yeah? And we, come on, bro. Come off it. What price they giving me for that? Leon's saying he's got a plus 135. What price they giving me for the Swarm? The boy. I want a bit, bit better than plus 135, though. I'm not going to lie, man. Has the, has, the, has the lines not moved a little bit better? Has people not bet on um, Goltsov? I feel like he would... 
Oh shit, plus 120 for Linton Vassell. Finally, finally they're respecting Linton Vassell. Finally. Delia, yeah, sorry, Delia. No, it's not Delia, it's Delia, right? Yeah, Delia, like that. Line has moved the other way, yeah. Capin, he wrote a couple of um, hate comments. You're an Anon who doesn't show your face on the internet and you're talking shit to someone who will never know who you are. You're a little nerd, full stop. Um, Rodney inside the distance. Bro, that should be minus 1,000, bro. You shouldn't have minus 125. That should be minus 1,000. Bulo saying, thanks for the advice. Not very educated on the PFL and haven't taped, so sorry for the late. Bro, no need to apologize, man. That's I, I, I like to just you know give education and um, tell you how I cap fight. So yeah, man, hopefully um, it helps you in the future. Man's a wet wipe, you already know. Um, you think Jenna Bishop and Kana Wantanabe is a good two leg parley? Uh, I don't have thoughts on those fights, bro. I need to um, I need to look into them. Leon saying thoughts on the Ivan Iv Ivanov fight. Um, I don't know, bro. Um, I haven't looked into that one either. Belostin is good. That's Ivanov, man. It's like interesting, you know. Um. Plus 140. Yeah, see, I'm taping a lot this week and I haven't done that fight yet. That's interesting, though. Let's have a look. Plus 140. Yeah, it's just like Ivanov never separates himself. Like, I don't remember Iva Ivanov. I don't remember Ivanov having, like, um, too much of separation in his fights. Like, I don't remember him winning the fight easily or handedly. Every fight I've fucking seen of that guy, it's like it's 50-50 if he's winning, you know? So it's like, it's tough to back, back those fights. And Belosta needs a good fighter at the end of the day. So, you know. Uh, what else we got going on? Pronounced Delia, yes. Oh, not Delia. Anti Delia. Anti Delia. Delia, really. They always say Delia. Because I just done tape on that and they have said Delija. Pretty sure they say Delija. Yo, man, shout out to the Sherry Air pick. I did my early research as usual and loved him as a pick. Then I saw everybody picking Chepe this week. Thanks for being on the same side. I like Sherry KO. Welcome, bro. I can only call it how I see it, but I think it's a 50 50 fight, honestly. Del E. Ya. Okay, bro. He would try to hug his opponent against the cage, yeah. This week's parlay madness going a minimum four to seven. You already know, bro. You already know. We need that. We need that, man. Obviously, the show's up massively overall, but you're only as good as your last week, apparently. And last week we did shit. So hopefully we get it again. Do I like Daniel James to KO Gom again? So the thing about this is that I bet on Daniel James last time, right? So I bet on Daniel James. Um, and he was like plus 150 or something. And now we're getting plus one. 20 plus 115 so i don't know if i can go back to the world there at the end of the day man he was losing that fight until we got the knockout so it's tough james ko gone recently but he's a dog yeah it's because of what i just said because he was he was losing that fight till we got the knockout i wasn't feeling good about that bet at plus 140 plus 150 range um but then he landed a knockout and at the end of the day like literally the main reason well I'm not going to say only, but almost the only reason I bet on him is because I thought he could land a KO. Like, but, so it's not, you know, it's it's not a surprise that he was losing until we got um, until we got the knockout. It's kind of how I feel about Trevor Beek and Charlie Campbell. Like, I think he's going to be losing until he gets the knockout if he does win. But to actually see it play out and the rest of the market see it play out, well, that's the reason that he's the underdog, even though he got the knockout. But and I feel like I feel like fucking James can knock him out again. Or I feel like Golden can take him to a decision and win via decision. Over one and a half rounds. Fight goes the distance at plus 180. That's decent, man. Golden wins by decision, plus 250. That ain't bad, honestly, because just looking at it from a contrary point of view, you know, look, looking at it from a different point of view, um, James seems quite comfortable. Uh, James seems quite durable. Um I don't mind the overs in that fight, just to go against the grain of the last fight, to be honest. Tyler Santos making me making PFL debut. Yep, yeah, that's true. 
um, making PFL. That yeah, she's minus one thousand. That's crazy. James made me dollars. You're legit, man. One of the very few cappers. Thank you, bro. Ah, I'm gonna keep doing it, bro. I appreciate you. Oh yes, thanks for the Wideman shout last week. Cash with that, even though it felt slimy. <laughs> yeah, man. You're welcome, bro. Um, that was a good pick. It felt slimy, but, I mean, he dominated the fight. I mean, all right, dominated. He clearly won that fight at plus 200. I mean, come on. As gamblers, give us that. Like, fucking hell. It, like, it should have been a no contest. But I'm a gambler. I ain't a... I ain't, I ain't a... I ain't a um, I'm not a... I'm not an analyst, you know? That's like, it's like the C-Rod versus Dolgarian fight. Everyone was going insane. I'm like, yeah, when I watched it live, I thought Dolgarian should have got the win. Actually, I rewatched it and I thought that's a 50 50 fight, but whatever. But, you know, watching it live, I thought it was a 50 50 fight, but bro, I bet on a plus 160. Like, give me the win in a 50 50 fight on a plus 160. Like, come on. And then everyone's going crazy. Oh, no, you know, terrible, um, you know, terrible decision. I, I don't really care about the decision. I care about how the fight played out, you know, and I got a plus 160. Exact same how I felt about the Wideman. Everyone's going insane. A few people commenting on my, on my post that I won, like, oh, wow. Wow, you think he deserved that? Wow, lucky bet, lucky pick. Bro, like, I don't give a shit about how the fight really ended. I kind of just care about me as a gambler. I made an amazing bet at plus 200. People can't differentiate between gambling and, um, yeah. Do you know Ball Can Bear from CKB? Train with Anti Delia. Delia. Yeah, so funny story. Um, one of my main training partners and one of my good friends is the main training partner of Ball Can Bear at ckb so i don't train at ckb i have done a little bit but it's a little bit far from me i train at other gyms in auckland and one of the guys i train with one of my best mates is um his his main training partner balkan bear balkan bear you might see him in the ufc soon from what i hear i don't know about him personally but obviously i know about him from my mate um trains with him every day you know he's training partners with izzy adesanya balkan bear trains with izzy carlos allberg all of those guys so Tanner Austin, are you from, where are you from, bro? Because earlier you speaking like you're from where I'm from. You're speaking like from, you're from London. But now you know about all these Balkan fighters. So I'm interested to know like where you're at, bro. And also the timing is a bit weird. Like where do you live? Tanner Austin, interesting guy, you know. I think Campbell decision is sneaky as fuck. Yeah, I could see it. I could see it, you know, some takedowns and stuff like that. Um, or maybe just... Look, if he don't get knocked out, he's probably going to win the decision. I mean, is he really going to finish Trevor Peak? I don't think he's going to finish Trevor Peak personally, man. Um, Big Bird saying, Dimitri Ivo will bring us above the poverty line. I'm getting there, bro. I'm getting there. The regional man himself, Big Bird UFC. Who's that? Who is that in your profile photo, bro? What's funny is Fangio paid me out for plus 1,300 Wyman KO, but ESPN bet didn't pay me. Yeah, it was very random. Very random. Um Grace Band saying that Wideman fight is the worst feeling loss of my career so far. 25 unit swing when they changed it from KO to decision. I thought I had it, and then second was like, that was some bullshit, man. But, you know, I think most bookies paid out for KO because most bookies grade it on whatever's called out by Bruce Buffett in the octagon. So, great. I would go crazy at your bookie. Live chat, live chat, live chat. Look through their terms and conditions specifically. Google their terms and conditions. And um, you might get your money back, bro. If you kick up a big, a big enough fuss, it's not impossible to get your money back. The first person is going to tell you no. The second person is going to tell you no. The third person, you might have to just keep going back at them. So, you know, it, it might not work. But a lot of times, I've seen it work. I've, I've seen it work. Ball can bear next up for sure. Heavyweight wide open. I'm a mixed bag, bro. Yeah, I know that. Big Bird UFC. Hope you're right, bro. Plus, plus 800. <laughs> Ivy is on PFL. Um, thoughts on Ray Longo admitting to betting on Weidman. Um, I know, I know, but he's... Um, what's his name? Um, Big Bird is the regional guy. Don't worry about that. Big Bird tells me all the regionals. Uh, what else we got? I had a 19 to 1 parlay and the KO prop. It's Wells, right? Oh, maybe it's Wells. Benino saying that Wideman fight makes me lose hope in a sport. How the fuck is that a win? Yeah, I mean, shit happens, man. I've seen some craziest stuff, but yeah, it was stupid. All right, bro. Um, I'm done.
All right, thanks a lot for coming into this live stream. I'm done now, bro. Um, you know, we broke down the main card and then I had a little chin wag with you while I'm drinking my tea, as you know. I've got to leave now. I've got places to be, people to see, and that's it. I'll be back in a couple of days with Parley Madness live stream. We're going to continue this crazy run we've been on. I'm not stopping yet, obviously. Only three months of the year gone. Over half of a bankroll profit. 53% increase in my bankroll since the start of the year, including the worst weekend of the year last year. So if we didn't have that, it's over 70 units. But you know, we're about to get back to that 70 unit results this week. And then we're going to continue climbing, breeze past that 100 unit year, and then go into that um, 200 unit year. So yeah, shout out to everyone, man. I appreciate you. Thanks to Bulu. Bang. Thanks for the content, Gray. Um, you're welcome. Gus is saying bang. NZS base croak tapped into the culture. Andy Lock, let's go. Love it. Wideman, bomb, 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 bomb. Thanks, Lucrative. You're welcome, COD. Mason saying appreciate, appreciate you. I'm out, boys. Peace.